All right, now is the time where I'm going to try to sell everybody some Amway. <laughs> You've been to that meeting, huh? All right, we'll let everybody get in and get settled. Appreciate y'all being here. Is everybody having fun so far? Enjoying yourselves, that's good. Seems like our German friends are happy and excited to be here. If anybody, if anybody treats you guys mean, you come tell me, all right? We'll take them, you know. By the way, just to let you guys know, you are surrounded by people who are carrying guns. Yeah, you really are. Yeah. And, and that's sad. It's sad that we live in a, in a culture, in a time, when people have to carry weapons to church. Because there have been church shootings. It just seems like it's one of the two favorite tragic things that people like to do now in this country is number one, they like to go into a school and shoot up children. And then they like to go into churches and shoot church people. Um, a church that uh, some of you are familiar with my, one of my friends in the ministry, Pastor Reg Kelly, all of his men carry. And uh, there was another church in Norwood where a man came in. He had, uh, he had had some psychological problems, psychiatric problems, but he had a beef with the pastor and he came into the church and started sh and was aiming at the, actually one of the bullets whizzed by the pastor and was embedded in the back of the, whatever it was behind him. And um, the men of the church, because in that particular church, no one carried a weapon. They had to rely upon men tackling that man with that gun. And some of those guys could have got killed. And I called, uh, you know, Pastor Kelly down in, Missouri and we talked about that and I said brother Reg that wouldn't have happened in our church he said no it wouldn't happen in ours either and it's it's a shame it really is that um, we were on a cruise one time and we were taking a tour through this island tour, the tour guide or the driver it was a woman she's real nice real nice lady and showed us Showed us her home, showed us her country and everything like that. And, of course, no weapons allowed anywhere on that island. And she questioned us about that. And, you know, why do you Americans think you have to carry guns all the time? And I told her, explained to her, she said, because, you know, people are getting shot all the time. And I said, let me explain something to you. All of the good people in America who carry guns hope to never have to use them a single time in their life. But when it comes to my wife, my children, my grandchildren, I would rather keep them. Amen? I would rather they survive. And so, um, yeah, we have a, Brother Roy stands back there and he just kind of watches what goes on in the parking lot and so on. So far, he's never pulled his pistol on anybody coming in the church. I'm glad. Uh, so far, we've never had an incident ever, but we do, we have had threats and we have enemies out there. And because of that, we have to take it serious. So, hope never have to do that. Amen? All right. Now I want you to take your Bible. I've shown you pictures. Now we're going to get to what we believe is truth. Uh, Paul said in, um, 
I think it's 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. is profitable for doctrine. And so we believe that the Bible is the final authority in all matters. There are religions that have holy books. However, those holy books in most, in fact, if not all of those religions, can be overridden by the clerics of that religion. In other words, whether it's a Muslim imam or even a Protestant pastor or let's say the Pope or any of those, those men can override what's written in the scriptures if they want to and say that what I said is what you need to believe in order if you want to go to heaven or please God or be able to pray or whatever it is. And one of the things that was really the Protestant Reformation was all about uh, with, you know, Martin Luther nailing his 92 thesis to the Wittenberg door and what happened was he was studying the book of Romans he was a Catholic monk. And as such, he would literally, he would flagellate himself. He would beat himself. Because he was told that if he did that, that that would drive his sinful impulses away. Well, it never worked. And Luther was upset about that. And he was angry at God because he kept seeing in the book of Romans the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. And he's going, that's not fair that God demands of me the same righteousness that he has, but I don't have the ability to be sinless and sin free. And then it occurred to him as he read the book of Romans, it's not the righteousness that I attain to by beating myself or starving myself or whatever it is. It's the righteousness that God adorns me with because he loves me. It's like a good marriage. If your husband makes you mad, ladies, but you love him, you can forgive him. Guys, the same way if your wife makes you mad, even though that almost never happens. <laughs> Amen, my sister says. But if your wife happens to upset you a little bit. Jesus said, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And we just pray and finally we just say, honey, I love you. And there goes all the bitterness and all the strife out of the marriage and you have two people that love each other and they stay together. Somebody say amen. So we learn all these things from the Bible because we believe the Bible is right. Turn to Psalm 68 verse 17. I would like for you to underline Especially some of these key verses that I'm going to give you. If you're going to understand. And, and, and if, if, if you're ever going to um, talk to somebody. Somebody that might be interested like you are about UFOs. And you can say, hey, I'm, I can show you what the Bible says about that. What? The Bible? They're in the Bible? Well, yes, they're in the Bible. And so I actually had that happen this year. A man came by our table at MUFON. And um, he saw that, he saw our banner there, ufopastor.com. This man was a, was a Christian man. I can't tell you much about him because he has asked me to keep his details and his identity secret. And I told him that he actually, and when he asked me that in email, he actually invoked the legal requirement for pastoral confidentiality. I cannot under penalty of law, nor I, I would not, simply because this man has put his trust in me, I would not give you any of the details of his life, what he does for a living, 
uh, where he works, what his name is, where he lives, anything like that. There are a couple of things I can tell you. Number one is that having spent some time talking with him, visiting with him, we've shared emails back and forth. I can tell you the man is a born again, Bible believing Christian. Number two, I can tell you that he is very, very well educated. He's a very smart man. Um, I don't know that I can tell you much beyond that, but I, those are the two things that I know about him. And that he's a great guy. We, we have sort of, we've kind of got a little bromance going there between us. I like the guy, I really do. But he came by our table this year and... While he was um, while he was there, he was, he was trying to talk to me, and he started telling me his story. Well, this is, and I've shared this story. Another man was standing there, and I said something to this man I'm going to talk to you about, and he didn't like what I said, so he jumped in. He injected himself in our conversation, and he basically told me how wrong I was. And I told the man, I said, sir, you've got the wrong guy. I am not wrong in what I said because what I said came from the Bible. And he said, you don't need to tell me about the Bible. He said, I went to seminary for five years. I pastored a church for several years. And he said, I've left all that behind because I now know a greater truth than what you have. And I said, sir, you don't know what you think you know. And as we began to talk, he began, I'll say this in a nice way, his ignorance. And at one point I said, sir, I am very sorry that you have turned out this way, that you feel this way. He said, don't feel sorry for me. I said, I do. Well, don't. I said, I'm going to anyway. Pray for you. He said, well, I'll pray for you too. See, he believed that there were other paths and other gods and other. Well, I turn around and look. And the man that wanted to talk to me had already left. And my wife told me later, she said, did you get a chance to talk to that guy I said no and she said he is wanting to tell you his story and I went oh she told me a little bit about what it was about and so all Saturday night I prayed God if it be your will bring this guy back by me I want to talk to him Sunday morning we get up we get on the elevator we go down we get off the elevator and there he's standing well, that was easy. And I said, don't leave today. I mean, you can leave, but don't leave until you come by my table. And if I'm not there, you have my wife call me and I will be here because I want to hear what you've got to say. Now, just for the sake of um, giving him a name, I'll call him Jack Webb. Jack Webb. Y'all remember Jack Webb, right? Dragnet. Did you know that he produced an American TV show called Project UFO? And I have the beginning of that in this week's Watchmen broadcast. And I'm going, finally, a show, a TV show where they're going to show UFOs every week. And it didn't last long, okay? It didn't last long. So I'm going to call this guy Jack Webb. Uh, when I finally sat down with him on a Sunday morning, I had my cell phone and I asked him, I said, can I, and I hit the record button. I said, do I have your permission to audio record what you're going to tell me? And I said, I have the camera pointing down so your face is not going to be on there unless you want it to be. But do I have your permission to record our conversation because I have a bad memory? And he said, absolutely. And uh, so we talked for probably, uh, Alicia, where is Alicia? How long was it? It was way over an hour. And I had Alicia, my daughter, transcribe our conversation. 
uh, and I have that stored away. He then, he was at MUFON because just prior to this last, this year's convention in MUFON, he had filed his UFO report with MUFON. Now he did this in May of this year. But the story itself took place 1959. And he waited all of these years to tell his story. Now, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, there are some things that are not in Jack's um, details that he gave to MUFON. But what I will tell you is that he lived in southern Mississippi, grew up. Um, is an African-American man, grew up in a large family. I think there was something like eight boys and four girls. His father was a Baptist preacher, same church for 50 years in Mississippi. And this is now he's got my attention. And he began to share the story with me that I'm going to read. I'm going to actually read the MUFON report. And if you, those of you who are listening online or those of you who are here, you want to write this down. It will be uh, on the recording later. If you go to MUFON's website, it is MUFON case number 122335. I'll repeat that again. Case number one, two, two, three, three, five. Now don't bother typing in Jack Webb for a certain, you won't be able to find it under Jack Webb, all right? But let me read to you his story, okay? Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. All right, anyway. You didn't know you was going to get a ham, did you? And I'm a ham, all right? Uh, this is from um, Jack Webb, we'll call him. He says, I am now 67 years old. This event occurred when I was around five to six years of age. Between 1959 and 1960, while living in the deep south, Vicksburg, uh, Vicksburg Mississippi. Late one evening, when my entire family were in the living room watching television, I chose to sit in the back of the room. The reason I sat in the back of the room was that morning I accidentally fell onto our hot wooden stove. Or it was a wood stove. It was an iron pot belly stove the way he described it to me. And he accidentally fell into that iron wood stove and he broke the fall to keep his body from hitting that he used his left arm to break the fall and he had this bad burn. He showed me the scar that he had. And he said, uh, my arm was burned, treated and put in a sling. The burn mark is on my left arm to this date. I did see that burn mark. Jack says, while sitting in the back of the room, I heard a voice speak to me. I thought this was one of my siblings, but they were all focused on the TV. So I decided to hold my head down and just kind of look up to watch them to see which one of his siblings was calling his name out. Then the voice spoke to me again, telling me the same thing. To go out to the back porch, I want to show you something. I could see that no one in the room said anything. The second time the voice was a lot more commanding and authoritative. So I got up, headed to the back porch. My mother had a watchful eye on me since I had been injured. My father was also present in the room. Now, uh, I'm not sure if this is 
written later on in this story. But let me give you some background that he told me about another reason why his mother was very watchful over him. When he was younger, his mother would go out to the back and hang out the laundry, hang out the wash, and let it dry. And he said he always used to like to go out with his mother, and when she would hang out like sheets and things like that, he would get on the other side to where she couldn't see him because always when his mother was hanging out the laundry, he could hear an entity singing some sort of musical tone to him. And he was fascinated by that music. Is that biblical? In Ezekiel, God described concerning Lucifer, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Do angels sing? Yes, they do. So, as he kept going out with his mother all the time, she, she couldn't hear the music. She didn't know what was there, but she was very curious as to why her son was always wanting to go out back with her. She knew, it's ladies, you are more intuitive than us men are, and you'll feel things that we don't feel, and all of a sudden you'll feel an uneasy something going on. Am I right? Well, that was his mother. So as he's walking out to the back porch, his mother is like, where are you going? Mom, I'm just going out to the back porch. But she knew something was up. Um, he said, I could see that no one in the room said a word. This was the second time the voice was a lot more commanding and authoritative. So I got up and headed to the back porch. My mother had a watchful eye on me since I had been injured. My father was also present in the room. I walked past my siblings and went on the back porch. I felt that the entity that spoke to me was still with me. So when I came on the dark back porch, it was at night, of the old house we lived in that was built during the Civil War days, I said, I don't see nothing. Then the voice spake to me again and said, look up. When I looked up, there was a huge dark object. Since there was a, a train yard nearby, to me the object looked as large as a locomotive. My immediate response was to say, wow, a circle of lights under the center circumference of the craft made me uh, come on. I don't quite remember this detail. But apparently something about those lights really got his attention. Uh, during my amazement, an upward retractable door opened. Now what he's seeing now, you have to, I want you to get this picture. He is, he's looking up in the dark sky and he's seeing a dark circular shaped object just above him. And then he sees this retractable door go up and open up, just like you would think of like in a Star Trek episode or something. And uh, he said, to my surprise, there was a normal, light, white woman, light-skinned white woman, dressed in white apparel to her feet. The way he described it to me was it was just this like this flowing robe that was just kind of blowing in the breeze. And he was just like fascinated with this. Beautiful bright golden hair. And he said um, my initial sense was that she was disappointed in me for some reason. But then she smiled. At first I only noticed her, then when I let my eyes wander, and he turned his attention back to her, he said, I saw a group of children 
of all ages standing next to her. Now he's not referring, he told me this. He said, I'm not talking about aliens. He said, I'm talking about human children. Of all ages, standing next to her. They were all in rows, maybe seven or eight per row. He said, since I have eight sisters and four brothers, I got it wrong. I said eight brothers and four sisters. But anyway, he said, I had developed a skill of relating to youth and making them smile or laugh. However, the youth had almost a trance-like appearance. And all, in other words, they all stood there very somber-faced looking. He said, when I smiled at the youth, the lady was somewhat surprised uh, at, at this behavior, and it was unexpected. Then she glanced at the youth, the children, and back at me as though she had just understood why I had smiled. Then she turned back to me with an intense look and made motions with her hands. And I realized the burn on my arm had just been healed. Now is that possible? Let's ask ourselves biblically. Do spirits have an ability over the human body? We know that from the story of Job. We know it from how the Bible described in the four Gospels how Jesus, in some cases, to heal people, had to cast out the devils that were causing them to be sick. Not in every case, but in some cases, that's what he had to do. She healed instantly the burn on his arm. Uh, she made a gesture which suggested that she had gained my confidence. Her expression also suggested what she had in mind would now be really easy. Then she uh, started the intense stare at him. And he said, I began to go into a trance. I could feel my heart beat speeding up to the point to where I literally became afraid. And he said, at that point, I broke away from her pull. Um, let me read this here. I broke away. Here's how he described it to me. He's watching this woman in this craft go into a trance he said he could feel sort of like a magnetic pull of his body toward that ship and he said I knew they were trying to take me up there and he said I knew by seeing those other children there, that I wasn't coming back. And he said, I think because of my fear in not wanting to go, all that magnetic pull let me go. And I, at that point, I stepped in and I said, let me tell you what I think. I think God just saved your life. And he said, yeah. And I said, I wanted you to experience this. Save you. He said, I agree with that. Um, let's see here. Um, she looked at me with a disappointing frown. I said to her I was going to get my sister. As I began to leave the voice, that's usually 
what I always said to people that were being mean to me. I'm getting my sister and I would, that was the end of that. She looked at me with a disappointing frown. I, I said to her I was going to get my sister as I began to leave. The voice that spoke to me initially spoke to me by name and said, Jack, don't go. I again said I was going to get my sister. I went into the house, told my sister um, that there was something I wanted to show her. She came out onto the back porch. It was completely dark. Nothing was there. I never saw the craft again, although there were incidents before and after the sighting, I believe, are related. I told you about part of that. He said, I should also point out that the inside of the craft was very well lit. There were other human-like entities on the craft that appeared to be piloting and controlling the craft. I never heard a sound from the craft. In communicating with them, no audible words were used. The craft never made a sound when it departed. He said, while I was facing the lady, the multiracial group of children were to her left. My impression is that the children were not happy. However, there was some other entity to her right that was out of my view that in a strange way connected to me. Upon entering the house, my mother asked me what happened to my arm since it had been healed. He, he, the bandage fell off. I told her the lady in the sky healed it. He said, if I were to be hypnotized to uncover more details, my heart would probably start racing as it did when the attempt was made to put me in a trance and pull me into the ship. At this time in the late 50s in the Deep South, I had no knowledge of spacecraft or anything like this. Yet I was... Uh, I was sharing this experience with close family members. Now he told me that he told his family, he told MUFON, and he told me. I thanked him for it. I believe every word he said. There are things that are in the spiritual world that you and I have never seen and probably are not aware of, but they are just as real as you and I sitting here today. And we're here with our Bibles to find out what those are. I believe that they are evil. I believe that they have an agenda. And you guys know me. If, if, that while this guy's telling me his story, I keep button in because I can't keep my mouth shut. Now you know why we carry guns here, right? <laughs> but I told him about, there's a, there's a man, his name is David Politis. He is an ex-cop. He goes around the country investigating missing people reports that take place usually in national parks and wilderness areas all around the country. One story he told was that a young couple, they had a three-year-old boy. They and uh, the boy's grandpa uh, took a camper out to a place where that was so remote. It was a national park. It was so remote that they didn't even have cell service out there. One day, while, you know, they had camped all night there. Grandpa was sitting around the fire. The mom and dad decided to walk down to the little creek there, the river, and do some fishing. They asked the little boy, you want to go with us? Sure. And so they told the grandpa, uh, Grandpa, we're going to go fishing with the little boy. I can't remember what his name was. And they grabbed their fishing gear and they began to walk. And every now and then, now you, somebody, you, all of you know, if you've got a three-year-old child with you, you're always looking Make sure you still have the three-year-old child. 
And they did that as they're walking out to this creek. And then one of them looked and the child is gone just like that. They searched for hours. Finally, somebody got in a car, went 10 miles down the road to where they could get like one peg out of their phone. And they called the county sheriff. They brought sheriff deputies out. They brought the state police out. They brought cadaver dogs out. They searched for this child for a solid week. They investigated the grandpa. They figured, well, maybe he's got something in his closet. Maybe he's a pedophile. Maybe he's this or that and the other. No evidence of that whatsoever. The relationship between the mom and dad at that time was fine. There was no reason for that child to disappear. And yet that child has not been found to this day. And if you go to his web, his uh, YouTube channel, I think is uh, Missing411. You guys know what I'm talking about. Watch some of his videos. Because I believe that people are being taken. And I believe it's in the Bible. It's the series that I'm doing now in the Watchman broadcast. Now let's turn our attention to Scripture. Psalm 68, verse 17. The Bible says this, The chariots of God are 20,000. You think it's tough owning two cars. Even thousands. So God has at least 20,000 and thousands more is what that's telling you. But then here it is. Even thousands of angels. What the Bible's telling you is, is that God's chariots literally are made of cherubim. Cherub. Angels. In fact, I took a picture of one one day. That's a joke. This is a rendition of Elijah. Where is Elijah going? To heaven. How is he getting there? A chariot of fire with horses of fire. What? this chariot and what were these horses? They were the angels of God. The chariots of God are 20,000 of angels. Is it literally what your Bible is telling you? Now, in 2 Kings, here's the story. It came to pass that when they were gone over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from from, uh, from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, not a chariot on fire. A chariot that is made out of a fiery substance of some kind and a horse, a living creature that is made of the same substance. Now we are what they would call carbon-based life forms. In other words, if you were to take us and burn us down to ashes, what those ashes are, are the carbon remains of who we are. If you burn a horse, it's the same thing. If you burn your dog, it's the same. I, my grandchildren, please don't tell, say that I told you to burn your dog. I have to tell them that. We are made, we are carbon based. These are of the spiritual realm we don't understand exactly what that fire is, but that is the substance of their being. They are spirits. They are of the spiritual realm. We would call them angels, but they literally are living chariots. Now, if that sounds so bizarre to you, let me remind you that Elon Musk and others are working on a completely self-contained artificial intelligent vehicle 
that you and I will be in probably within the next 10 years. Usually if I go out of town, if I fly and I rent a vehicle, the cars that I'm getting now have driver assistance in the steering wheel. First time I felt that, I'm going, what is wrong with this car? What I figured out was the car was reading the lines on the road. And if I got too near the lines on the road, the steering wheel started turning back into the lane. That is, and that is artificial intelligence. There will come a time when you will walk out to your vehicle and you will say, good morning, Dodge. Good morning, Ford. I need to go to the store. And you get in and the car takes you to the store. That day is coming. My insurance agent told me that he went to an agent's meeting. The topic was not if, but when cars are totally 100% self-sufficient and artificial intelligence, that when there is a wreck, who is responsible? If you're not driving the vehicle, it can't be you that had the accident. If somebody hits your car, but their car has artificial intelligence, then who's artificial? Is it the software engineers who wrote the software? Is it the, the manufacturer of the vehicle? Who's going to pay the insurance bill? We're talking about things that we never thought we would talk about in our lifetime, and now we're having to deal with them right now. So we're living in a world where what was science fiction when I was a kid now is science fact, including living vehicles. Because apparently that is what God and these lesser gods ride in. In Matthew chapter 24, here's what I believe. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall, stars shall fall from heaven. We talked about that. The powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his what? His angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. I believe that Elijah's story is a typology, a Bible story showing us what is going to happen in the future. In other words, I don't believe now that a... a an angel with two arms and two legs is going to fly down and pick me up and take me to heaven. I believe that I'm going to get in a fiery chariot and ride in style of glory. Somebody say amen. Wouldn't that be neat? Talk about hot rod. You're getting one, amen. Ezekiel chapter 1, I want you to turn your Bible there. Let's examine the story that Eric von Daniken examined when he was a young man. He was a, a student in a Catholic school. I believe he grew up in Switzerland. And it made him question his Catholic upbringing. He says he still believes in God. But his biggest question was, if he really is God... The, the God in the Bible, why does God need a chariot to ride around in? And it, it messed his mind up. So he left the Catholic faith over that. What I want to do is give you assurance that yes, I don't believe God needs a chariot, but sure is nice looking, right? In fact, think about it. The heaven that you and I are going to. Have you ever been to a city where part of the city was blighted? In other words, buildings condemned, half torn down, 
garbage everywhere, uh, uh, graffiti all over the place, trash everywhere like that. If God said to you, this is your home for eternity, why would you want to go? But instead, he's built us a city that is at, going to be absolutely so beautiful in eternity, we won't get used to it. The streets paved literally with gold that is so pure, you can see through it. The gates of the city being made all of one pearl. And I'm just, if you will read the description of heaven in your Bible, you will see that what God makes is splendid and magnificent and beautiful. Amen. So, and I asked these guys a question a while ago. I said, is around in a Volkswagen? Nothing against German cars, mind you. But does the Queen of England around in a Volkswagen? No. In fact, at Prince Charles' coronation, when the Queen dies and he becomes king, there's a 400-year-old chariot that is just gilded with gold. And it represents the royalty of majesty. Something that we don't know much about here in America because we don't have a king but I assure you, Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, when he appears, there's going to be a majesty about his appearance. Do you believe that? Say amen. So the chariot that God rides in is going to be absolutely splendid. And here's the description of it. Ezekiel 1 verse 4. I looked and behold a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof is the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was the sole, like the sole of a calf's foot. Watch this. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. You see the eye candy here. Because rednecks love sparkly things, don't we? Right? Amen. In verse 12, and they went, everyone straight forward, whether the spirit was to go, they went and they turned not when they went. The Bible's describing how they move. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. When people report seeing UFOs, they talk about how bright they were. How beautifully lit they were. How it was literally unavoidable to see. Jack Webb's story that I just read you. When that door opened and he saw this woman, she was no hag, was she? She was no mean old witch looking woman with a Ward on her nose and an evil, mean looking face. She appeared to him as this beautiful, light skinned, beautiful, long, blonde hair, a beautiful robe flowing off of her. Something that was inviting to him, even as a five year old child. Because anything else would have scared him off. She wanted to allure him into that ship. Do you see where I'm saying now? This is God's chariot here. And it's glowing like the, with the appearance of fire, like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of lamps. And it went up and down along the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. What I've just described for you, 
a UFO moves. The is there and without even having to accelerate, it's gone in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Does that make sense to everybody? This is the chariot that God rides in. And the ones that people are seeing around the world, they are just like this. Isaiah, or excuse me, Ezekiel verse one, chapter 1, verse 15. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel. I mean, if it's a chariot, it's got to have wheels, right? One wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like under the color of a barrel. This is a stone. It's a beautiful, shiny stone. And they four had one likeness and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now various artists have tried to draw this. I'm not sure exactly what it looks like. And when they went, they went upon their four sides and they turned not when they went. In other words, the side that was facing east, if it went west, the side that was facing east still kept facing east. If it went south, the side that was facing east still faced east, but the vehicle went south. That's what it, the Bible is describing for you. And then we get into these wheels. Now watch this. As for their rings, which I think are part of the wheels, they were so high that they, and let me ask you this question. What is the planet Saturn like? It's a ball with rings, correct? By the way, Jupiter has them too. We just couldn't see them for years. Neptune has them. Oranos has them. Mars doesn't, apparently the Earth doesn't. Venus and Mercury doesn't. But from Jupiter on, those planets have rings around them. To me, that would be a wheel in the midst of a wheel. I think God has given you an example of what they look like. So as for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went and the wheels went by them, when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Watch this now in verse 20. Here it is. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. Here it is. Underline this in your Bible. For the spirit of the living creature, the angels, was in the wheels. Now I want you to understand this. It would be like if I, if I had some way of imparting my spirit into this lifeless phone. And all I had to do was think where I wanted my phone to go. My phone would go exactly where I wanted it in my mind to go because my spirit literally was inside of this. Now, let me explain this in Christianity terms. How many of you have the Spirit of God abiding and living inside of you? Raise your hand. So that whenever the Spirit wants to go somewhere, you're going because the Spirit of the living God is inside of you. Does that make sense to everybody? In every story I've ever read, one of them, Bob Lazar, a man by the name of Robert Lazar. He was the first person who ever used the phrase Area 51 on national television. This was 1986. No one had even heard about a place called Area 51. And he's been working out there for several months. 
And he came and did a live interview with George Knapp in Las Vegas and said, he said, I work in a place at Area 51 called S4. I am working on one of nine captured alien craft. And later on, he was asked questions about what he saw. Somebody asked him, were you able to see inside the, the disc that he was working on? He said, yeah. And he's, they said, what did you see? He said, not much. He said, I saw three little chairs and some form of panel there. And they asked him, was there something like a guidance system? Was there something that you would recognize like from a plane or a car or anything like that? He said, there was nothing like that. And he said, what we realized was that all that the pilots or the aliens, whatever, had to do was just lay their hands on this panel. And wherever they thought to go, that's where the ship went. And he said that basically the ship and their pilots were one. And it was alive. And that is exactly what you just read in your Bible. That wherever the cherub wanted to go, the wheels which were not attached to the angels, they went wherever the angels went because the spirit of the angel or the living creature or as John put it, the beast was in those wheels. And that's how they worked. Now, in verse 21, when those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood, and when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels, and the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. Remember, this thing looks magnificent. It looks glorious. And under the firmament were... Uh, were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Everyone had two which covered on this side, and everyone had two which covered on that side their bodies. And then the Bible says, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. Josh, whose throne is that? It's God's throne. As the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Who is that man? It's Jesus Christ. And I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it. From the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about. Doesn't the Bible say that our God is a consuming fire? As the appear oh, I like this. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. This is God's chariot, and it bears with him his glory. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. I guarantee you, if you saw Jesus sitting on his throne, on his chariot, you would fall to your Somebody say amen. Who'd like to own one of these? Amen! Gas is cheap. Tell Joe Biden, keep your gas. <laughs> now, watch this. Just so you know the connection between, there was a throne on there. And how many angels were carrying this throne? According to Ezekiel, what did we just read? How many angels were, were there? How many? Four. When the Ark of the Covenant was moved from one place to the other, how was it transported? Four Levite priests carried it. Not three, not two, not five. 
4 did. Why? Because what was on earth had to match what was in heaven. God told Moses specifically, you have to do it the way you see what I did in heaven. And what happened when David tried to move the Ark of the Covenant some other way? What did he do? Put it on an ox cart. And there was a man riding back there. And the ox stumbled and the cart jarred. And this man stuck his hand out to steady the Ark of the Covenant. And what happened to him? He died. Do you know why? Because there's only... See, that Ark is God's mercy seat. It's the gospel. And without the one way to heaven, there's death. You see what I'm saying? You believe that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You even try to move the ark, which represents the gospel, represents salvation. It was God's mercy seat. You try to do that some other way. There's no life. There's just death. So in Solomon's temple, very quickly, I'm not going to read all of this, but when Solomon built the pedestal for the Ark of the Covenant to sit on, notice in verse 33 that it had a firmament or it had a platform on it made of crystal and underneath that platform was wheels. Just like in Ezekiel. And the wheels had the work of a chariot wheel. Their axle trees, their naves, their fellows, and their spokes were all molten. An axle tree and naves, the axle tree is the rod that goes into the chariot wheel. And the naves and the fellows are the spokes and the things that join the spokes in with the axle trees. And that's what holds the wheel together. And that is exactly how Solomon had the throne of God built in his temple. It looked exactly like a chariot. Isn't that something? So, Elijah went up into heaven by a whirlwind. We know he went into a chariot of fire and a horse of fire. We already read that story. In 2 Kings, I'm moving through some of this very quickly because some of you are getting pork hungry. And I don't want you to miss that. But here is Elisha. And this is after Elijah has already departed into heaven. Does Elisha believe in fiery chariots that fly in the sky? Does Elisha believe in that? Sure he does, because he saw Elijah leave. So if Elisha can believe in fiery chariots flying through the sky, how come you can't believe in them? read it in your Bible. All right. Blessed are those who see and believe and yet yea blessed rather are those who have not seen and yet believe. I've never seen a UFO and don't have to. But I believe them. Because I'm reading it right here in the Bible. Elisha is, Elisha's servant is scared to death because the armies that hate Israel, they're, be, they're being surrounded. By the way, this is a prophecy. This is a prophecy. This is not only what happened in the past, this is going to happen in the future. And so in verse 15, halfway through the verse, his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. So let's do the math on this. Remember the war that Michael and Satan fought in heaven. How many angels were on Satan's side? How many? One third. How many then were on Michael's side? Do the math. Two thirds is still more than one-third. 
So who's got more on their side? Them or us? Elisha, verse 17, prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of UFOs. Now, I paraphrase that. But the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. These things are real. If the good guys have them, the bad guys have them as well. So have I made you believers yet? Or are you still waiting on that pork? Isaiah 66, Behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind. Jeremiah 4, 13, Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. Zechariah 6, 15, I, I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass, and the first chariot were red horses, and the second chariot were black horses, and the third chariot were white horses, and the fourth chariot grizzled. Well, hold on a second. Does this story sound familiar to anybody? Revelation. Revelation chapter 6. In the opening of the first four seals, he, God is releasing red horses, white horses, black horses, and in Revelation it's pale horses. Here in Zechariah it's grizzled and bay horses. So you got two witnesses now in your Bible. Watch this now. Are you ready for this? Where the seals are going to be opened and God is going to release flying, fiery chariots upon this world. And you say, well, I don't know, Pastor Mike. That may be your interpretation of the Bible, but I don't know about mine. Tell you what we'll do. We'll eat lunch and then we'll wait and see when these things start falling down from heaven and flying all over the place. Then we'll see who was right. And I don't care if it's me or not. I just, I just know God's right. Can I hear God's people say amen? Uh, let, let me just, let's see. Do I want to, I don't know where I want to go with this. Oh, I, I want to go right here. I want to stop right here. Because numbers fascinate me too. 33. That number significant in the world. Freemasonry. Secret societies. Well, here you have a story in the Bible that explains why. We have a king by the name of Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. And he gathered all of his hosts together, and there were 30 and two kings with him. How, do you, how many does that make? 33. 33 kings with him, and horses and what? And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. He's warring against the Israelites, the people of God. Does he win that war? No, he loses bad. So he decides he's going to go fight them again with his 33 army and his chariots. Does he win that war? No, he loses both of them. If you've lost two wars, I think you ought to give up. Amen? Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? Huh? Go ahead, Jersey. Jersey boy. Yes, sir. Yeah. I don't think the image was clear enough to see. I, and what he's talking about, there's an, there's an image. You look this up. 
that was done by Eliphas Levi. It was of an occultist in the late 1800s. And he drew this image of a creature that he called Baphomet. And Baphomet had this hand making this gesture. And he had this hand making this gesture. Okay? And what this represented was the fusion of opposites. And it also represented as above, so below. But it also represented more than that. It represented the joining of things that are up here with the things that are down here. Now let me, since I can't answer your question about that image there at the Nazca Lines, I'm just going to take you someplace else with that same idea. Okay? Harvard psychiatrist John Mack. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. He is a tenured professor, highly regarded as a very brilliant psychiatrist. World class. Harvard University. Doesn't get any better than Harvard. He has a friend that also is looking into UFO abductions and John Mack gets interested in it. And he starts doing his own investigations of people who say they have been abducted by aliens. Now, this is the early 90s. People hadn't, people hadn't thought, of, nobody was talking about that back then. And so he began to interview these people. He would interview them, find out what kind of person they were. He would do a psychiatric workup of them to see if they had any form of psychosis, if they had any mental defect. If there was anything wrong with their brain, things like that. And he found out that they were completely normal, completely healthy as far as their mind and their brain and their character was concerned. Then he would use hypnotic regression and he would get them to tell the stories of their abductions. Some of which went all the way back into the child, their childhood. And Mac wrote a book called Abducted. And when that book came out, Harvard formed a committee to try to fire him. Because Harvard, years ago when it started, used to be a seminary. And the guy said, you, you know, we're a seminary, so you can talk about God, the devil, you can talk about angels and devils, and heaven and hell. You just can't say aliens at Harvard. And they were going to fire him. And they realized that they could, they had no grounds to fire him. And they said, go ahead and study whatever you want to study. So he writes this book called Abducted. And, I, and I'm reading through it now. But the bottom line is, out of every case that John Mack researched, including, he's the one that went to Zimbabwe to interview those 62 children who saw that craft land outside their school playground. But he said out of, let's say he interviewed 100 people. I'm just kind of making a, a guess here. But he said out of 100 people who said they had been abducted by aliens, all 100 of them said the same thing. That number one, the aliens had chose, were telling these people, we're choosing you because we want you to help us because we're fighting a war and it involves earth and we need you. And number two, look into our eyes. By the way, they all spoke telepathically to the abductees because the aliens spoke a language that no one knows. That's in the Bible, by the way. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And when the people would look into their eyes, they would get images flash into their brains of like the end of the world and the, you know, the battle of Armageddon and the world on fire and, and how humans are destroying the planet and so on and so on. Every one of them reported the exact same thing. And then... In every abduction case, and it didn't matter how old the person was, one guy 
did a hypnotic regression and he remembered a situation where when he was 10 years old, the aliens withdrew seed from him. We would call that child molestation. But he said in every single case, the aliens were concerned with one primary goal. That is, withdrawing human DNA, seed and eggs from men and women to create a hybrid species between their race and the human race. And that is recorded in Daniel chapter 2 with these words they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Not only is this real, but their agenda is hybridization of their race with ours. And it's been done before, has it not? Does not Genesis 6 say that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they chose them wives all of which they chose there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bare children unto them the same became mighty men on the earth men of renown there was before the flood and there was after the flood already a hybrid race of angels, devils, and humans. And God destroyed them. And he will, again, only I believe that instead of it just being a few who are hybridized, I believe it will be all mankind except those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. Amen.